slumped in the bath was the lifeless body of newlywed Margaret. Her marriage had lasted just 36 hours. It was all very suspicious. The years between about 1900 and 1925 were a key period in the development of forensic medicine. Forensic pathologists, forensic pathology really began to gain a very high public profile. Murder cases really gripped the public's imagination and the press were all over these cases. Inspector Neal didn't hang about. Within hours, he had returned to the Highgate guest house of Louisa Blatch. Louisa told the inspector as much as she could about her former tenant. She told of how carefully Mr. Lloyd had inspected the bathroom before renting the room and what had happened on the night of the drowning. He took careful measurements of the bathtub. Could a grown woman really drown accidentally in such a small tub? The inspector had his doubts. There was nothing to suggest they'd been drowned by force. Spilsbury went back to his books. How could Smith have done it? There, buried in the medical journals, he found what he was looking for. The vagus nerve is a long and complicated nerve running from the brain through the face and thorax to the stomach. Sudden pressure on the vagus nerve can have a startling effect. A stranglehold, a karate chop, or crucially, a sudden rush of water up the nose can trigger unconsciousness. It would then be relatively simple to hold a person under long enough to drown them. Inspector Neal seized on the theory. With the help of a willing volunteer, he attempted to submerge her by pushing down on her head and shoulders. No matter how hard he tried, she was able to stay above water. Then, without warning, the inspector seized the volunteer's feet and yanked her under the water. She went instantly limp. In a panic, she was hauled out, and frantic attempts were made to resuscitate the poor woman. Mercifully, she choked back to life. A very close call, but the prosecution now had their case. This was a landmark investigation for forensic science. Never before had police and forensics worked side by side throughout a case. Their close collaboration had produced a plausible theory for cause of death with dramatic evidence to support it. Forensic science had truly come of age. This is typical of somebody being clubbed or hit with a hammer or, or some blunt instrument. You can see that it's a sort of fan-shaped pattern going outwards, uh, and we've got many different sizes of droplets in it, ranging from very, very small ones to quite large ones. Most of them are shaped like an exclamation mark. Mm -hmm. So analysis of the blood spatter tells us instantly that uh, it was a brutal murder. Yeah, th this amount of blood, this amount of, of force shows a, a brutal murder. <laughs> This is what he used to board the gun. This is necessary to compact and hold the powder. When you're ready to fire, pull that back one more click to the forecock position. Pull the back trigger. Churchill was teamed up with one of Scotland Yard's first police photographers. They came up with an ingenious way of photographing these rifling grooves. They put dentist's wax inside the barrel of the gun and then when it uh, cooled down, they eased it out of the barrel and photographed the remaining sort of wax core. The resulting photograph clearly showed that the rifling grooves left in the wax by the barrel matched up exactly with those left on the bullet. This was the first time ballistic evidence had ever been presented in this way. The cause of death has always been one of the most problematic areas of forensics. The corpse is not always willing to give up its secrets, and these days experts are much more cautious in giving their testimony. Yet some of the techniques developed by these early forensic experts are still in use today. They were true pioneers. 